Hello, everyone, and thank you to FinTech Talents for inviting me to talk at this auspicious event. I'm incredibly excited. I'm based down here in Perth, Australia, after spending many years in Asia. My name is Neil Cross, and I've done many things around the technology and fintech space, from you know writing computer games to um, working for for Microsoft and uh, DBS Bank out of Singapore. But what I'd like to talk to you today about is quite a personal story that as I kind of rose up through my corporate career and um, I had a side project and a project that to this day I'm incredibly passionate about and a project that I got engaged on where while well, I was um, living and working in Singapore every Friday evening I'd, I'd rush to get to the airport a little earlier because I had a five o'clock flight from Singapore to Sumatra. Uh, Sumatra is one of the largest islands in the world, uh, the second, I believe, or second largest island in Indonesia. And, and so I'd have to rush to the airport for the 5 p.m. flight from Singapore into Medan, which is the capital of Sumatra, and then spend four, roughly four to five hours in a car going from the airport up through the Medan and into the mountains to spend time in the Sumatra jungle with the Sumatra orangutans. And I'll be working on a project in the jungle on, on I'll get there about midnight and then uh, I'd wake up early on Saturday and start working on, on this project. And, and then I'd leave Sunday, get back in the car, drive for another um, you know, four or so hours, get to the airport, get back into Singapore about 11 p.m. And, uh, and and then go back into, you know, uh, corporate work life in Singapore on a Monday morning. And I did that for, for many years, for, for about four or five years. I, I That was my life on the weekends, working on my passion project. I wouldn't call it a hustle. In fairness, I've kind of I've kind of gone off the term hustle, the truth is told. I've kind of gone off the word disruption as well. Um, I, I really liken it to, you know, a hobby or a passion. It's something that I'm incredibly um, interested in. And it's, it's it, and, you know, to this day, it's been working on it today, it is, it's something that I put a lot of time and money and focus on. And that's the story I want to tell you today is the story of how I, um, built a project in the middle of the Sumatra jungle, while at the same time I was doing a very large corporate um, job um, in, a, in a payments company and, and then later on in a bank. And the title of the presentation is called, called Jungle Innovation. So moving on with this, I think the um, thing at this particular moment in time that I've observed is it's a wonderful time. It is a wonderful and it's an awful time to be a leader in this COVID world. And I say um, it, it's a wonderful time because we need leadership desperately across the world. Now, thankfully, we, we kind of have actually, hopefully we're coming through to kind of towards at least the beginning of the end of this tragedy. But we still need leadership and it's an environment where actually any leader will do. You don't have to be a good leader. You don't have to be an amazing leader. Um, you certainly don't need to have an, an MBA or won awards. You, you just need to be there. In, in this moment where people are worried about getting a disease or losing their job or losing people they love, a complete change in lifestyle and, and um, fortunes and finances, any leader will do. And I don't know if you've noticed, you know, all around the world, um, most politicians and prime ministers and presidents have really been given a free card to lead. And that's because as the citizens or as the workers in a company, we need someone at the front that we believe in knows the way out of this. And that's how I'll preface this talk with, it, with this current lens, is actually you don't need to be a good leader. 
you know, your job as a leader is really just not screw this moment up. Your staff or, or your citizens, if, if you run a country, are very forgiving at the moment. It will decline over time, we know. But at the moment, they're very forgiving. So as a leader, you just have to get the basics right. Uh, but most importantly, you need to be the one who has clarity on making decisions and are moving things forward. And that is what I've learned from this jungler experience, the things that I've learned around leadership. So something I, I, you know, I've learned and the lessons that I've learned building a, a, uh, an initiative in the Sumatra jungle are highly relevant into how you lead organizations in a, well, we're still in fairness, a, a COVID world. Let's not go post-COVID, just that. And that's the first thing that I thought I'd, I'd demonstrate. So this journey started quite a number of years ago. Um, it started, um, actually, I think I've lost weight since then. That's, that's, that's quite pleasing. I was working for a, a global uh, payments company at the time. And I was going through this phase in my career when I was, I was, I wouldn't say I was going anti-technology. It was certainly the start of the phase of where I was becoming um, less um, less blinded by the technology, if you will. I mean, I've been in technology for a very long time. You know, I got my first computer when I was 11. Um, even to load a game, you had to program it. I mean, it had no mouse. It had rubber keys and 48K. And in fairness, you couldn't use all the 48K. And, um, and even to load a game, you had to program it to type load, quote, quote, return, you know, get a cassette, pull it in the device, and, and that's how you play the game. And games just fascinated me. And I've always been fascinated, and, and in some cases kind of blinded by the technology. And, and, but I did, as, as my, I feel I started to mature in my innovation capability and spending a lot of time on corporate innovation, you know, I realized that um, there really is a process in in how you invent things. And, you know, technology and innovation are quite separate things. And as I was working um, for this payments company at the time, and I was trying to come up with a process which really, for me, um, really kind of created a factory process to invent or solve problems. And I was looking at various tools at the time, things like, you know, d design thinking and customer journeys and lean startup and experimentation. And I thought, well, why, what if I could put some of these together and create this kind of universal problem solving technique that we could use to solve any problems, whether they were for payments or, or technology. And so I did, I thought, right, so we put this framework together and <clears throat> We, we, you know, we tested it and actually thought this is working incredibly well. But let's try it outside of our normal domain. Let's try to, to solve, put it, put it to use on a problem which is more, more real, yet yeah, more human, well, I suppose, more, more, more animal, if you will, and uh, more global. So rather than keep testing this universal problem solver on payments, based problems or, or, or um, technology based problems. Let's take this problem solving engine that we've invented and, and let's try and solve a different problem. Let's put it on to how we can help save the orangutans. As we know, the orangutans are one of our you know, live, closest living relatives. Um, we're not descended from orangutans, we're not, we're not actually descended from apes either, uh, but we all came from the same place. We all descended from the same source and, uh, you know, depending which decade you're in, it's either chimpanzees um, or orangutans or bonab apes are the ones identified which have the closest DNA match to humans. But you can safely say that the great apes are our cousins. And so what I wanted really was to um, focus on some of the problems with the um, Sumatra orangutans and using our universal problem solver, how could we 
you know, look at help to save, I say, you know, humanity's um, closest living relative. And so we hear a lot about orangutan protection, but the brutal reality is, is this, yeah? is the fact that orangutans and deforestation is happening faster than ever, despite perceptions you know, of us slowing this down, of companies changing, of, of the world doing good. It, most of it's a lie. This is the brutal reality, is the fact that, you know, they're destroying forests at a faster rate than ever, than the beautiful Sumatran forest, which is the only place in the world that you can see tigers, orangutans, elephants, and rhinos all in one one ecosystem and that within a, a probably five years will change the rhino will be gone um it's amazing but it's just been you know cut down so we can essentially plant palm oil you know and and so the, the you know the orangutans have been been slaughtered the rhinos the elephants and the tigers are, are going and and so this is a, a, a thing we should really be focusing on, yeah, rather than thinking about, oh, you know, how can we invent drones that deliver bagels to office workers in, you know, in, in downtown or SOMO um, San Fran? Maybe we should be putting a lot more focus on, you know, how actually do we save the environment we live in, the air we breathe, we nice, the water we drink, and the relatives, the animals that we live with, which are a part of us, yeah, we, we're not a separate entity stuck on this planet, we think we are, but you know, we're born with this thing, this is, this is our family, this is our backyard, this is our family. And so I picked up the Mascard Labs team and we flew into the Sumatran jungle and we, we put together this, uh, say, we, we installed our innovation factory. We spent a lot of time interviewing the Trek guys, the drivers in the village, the guest house owners, the restaurant owners, um, other tourists, um, uh, flight booking centers, all kinds of people. And really spent a lot of time trying to understand the mechanics of this tourist location, the mechanics of, and the money flows around the protection of the orangutans and the solution was so we put in the innovation for me it's all about it's not about technology it's not about creating cool stuff it's really around innovation for me is finding the right problem and that's critical it's really make sure you've got the right problem it's, it's not a symptom of the problem it's not the wrong problem just you know and it's not a, a problem that's already been you know highly covered find the right problem yeah and then from that, innovate forward and, and find an elegant solution. And uh, elegance doesn't have to be beautiful, but you, you wouldn't expect it to be ugly. Um, you don't over-engineer, you don't overspend, you, know, you don't over-deliver. You find a solution which fits your problem in, a, in an elegant manner. And the final thing, that it needs to be successful. So either there's an increase in revenue or profitability, a decrease in cost, an increase in customer or citizen satisfaction. And so that, that's innovation, is find the right problem, solve it in an elegant manner, but successful, yeah. Uh, and so we spent a lot of time digging down into the problem and coming up with solutions. And we had like a judging criteria. And the winning solution was that this village, Bukit Lawang in Sumatra, needed um, a higher quality level of ecotourists. And that's because a lot of the people visiting there were European backpackers. Um, so not only did they smell, um, in fairness, they, they didn't spend a huge amount of money. And also these people, they come for their holiday for their two weeks, and then they go back home, and their intentions are good. You know, they've seen their orangutans, they're in love with them, they like stuff on Facebook, but their impact finishes there or well, it generally finishes there. And so what we realized through the innovation process is that there needs to be a higher quality, more exclusive hotel property that attracts powerful 
uh, local Asian executives. And so if we can get these executives of large companies in Southeast Asia, bringing their families, you know, spending time with the orangutans, understanding their plight, understanding deforestation, we hope then that these executives will go on to make better decisions and they have enough power and reach that, you know, throughout their entire career that they will make effective change. Now, that was the workshop. And so we ran the workshop, the concepts got evaluated, the winning concept was this boutique hotel and, you know, end of offsite, we went back to Singapore. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a call, actually I was talking to him today, Abdullah, who's the village religious leader, the imam. And he was the one who took us trekking and he helped us organize the event. And he said, Neil, um, wh when are you coming to help? And I said, oh, uh, well, you know, the workshop's finished now, Abdullah. We're, you know, we're moving on, we've, we've tested the innovation. Uh, engine and it works quite well so say so thank you you know i'll try and come out for a, for a holiday sometime and he said oh i i really thought you were going to help us and you know this kind of i said to him well you know i need to go back to work after a little bit look, look, let me think about this and it, it just sat at, at the back of my mind for for, for a while it just you know, it was this scratch, it was the itch I couldn't scratch. And um, and I just had this, you know, moment of realisation, well, two moments of realisation. Um, one was that the Indonesian rupiah um, was at a, is a very low exchange rate to, to the Singapore dollar. And, and so doing things in Indonesia um, could have more impact dollar for dollar. So, okay, so... Um, you know, my level of wealth, which isn't, you know, certainly isn't huge. Actually, I could do something significant. And, and secondly, that kind of opened up the possibility and made me think, you know, if, if, if not you, then who? You know, I was very lucky that I've kind of fallen into this place where I've invented this universal problem solver technique that would go on to you know power my career and, and, and tested it and worked out a way to help save orangutans and, and I, did, I didn't do anything Remember, I didn't do anything and so if not you then who and then I just rang Abdullah a week later and said look you know I'm coming and and, and so this is this slide we we uh, we we f winning innovation from the jungle innovation challenge um, was the start of the project. This was the old tourist office. Abdullah managed to find me this as the base location. So I took uh, some of my salary, bought the old tourist office, and we started to build. And so we started to build. Um, and believe me, I'm, I've never built anything construction wise i've built software before um but i've if i've never built buildings before and properties before and especially not ones that kind of go up into a cliff in the middle of the jungle yeah I mean, <laughs> extreme but you know um i i was good at design and i'm not bad at management and so this, this property started to build and you know we we start to go up and up and it, it started to look less like a, you know, it started off looking awful. I mean, it looked like a multi-story car park, um, but it started to take shape and look beautiful. And then eventually um, we built our first building there, Hotel Orangutan, right in the middle of the jungle. And, and this was, as I said, going every afternoon on Friday to the airport, flying over to another country, um, in Sumatra in Indonesia, driving for four hours, going to this place and, and, you know, managing the build of the hotel. And eventually we moved on and, and built more um, rooms here and built all the way up the hill. So what I'd like to show you now is this is just a short advert for Hotel Orangutan and what the property looks like today.
uh, away at Hotel Orangutan. So obviously now with COVID, the, the property's closed and we, you know, we uh, have the staff on, on furlough. But so we, we built this beautiful property, the first property, uh, and it was really interesting, my life at that time. Well, my life's always very interesting, if the truth is told. Um, but that time was particularly interesting. So I was working at a huge, you know, payments company and, and moved on to, you know, the big bank as a CXO. And, you know, we lived in the metropolis of Singapore. And at the same time, in the weekends, flying off to another country and, you know, living in a, well, a shack while we were building. We were living in a shack with a mattress on the floor in the Sumatra jungle and going up and, and you know, getting monkeys coming in and, and stealing your clothes occasionally and, and uh, you know, the old tiger coming to the village. Um, but the thing, the important thing, I think, from this is really the distillation of kind of understanding of leadership and innovation and corporates that I'd learned through this process. And that's really what the presentation's about. And it's, it's interesting taking these kind of hardcore corporate innovation techniques and leadership principles um, that we all you know hear about and, and hopefully learn from and, and take those and try and apply them to basically uneducated village people. I mean, they're a family, but you know, when they're very smart, they are very creative, they're in touch, but the, the level of, of basic education is fairly low. And then obviously we've got the barrier of, of language as well. But interestingly, it's how they simplified my corporate innovation and the leadership techniques, which really was the great learning for me and how then I took these corporate innovation and leadership techniques, took them to the Sumatra jungle and utilized them with the people in the village, got them reshaped by the village people and then took those reshaped and, and, and rehoned and sharpened techniques and then took them off to back to the corporate world and, and watch really the, the huge acceleration and success of those processes because of the time spent in the Sumatra jungle. So let me talk you through some of the lessons that I've learned. And the first thing, remember I said earlier, I said innovation for me is not really about, you know, inventing cool stuff. It's not about technology. It's really about solving problems. And um, one thing I did learn that I hadn't really spent enough time on the problem. We all, we, you know, we all like to innovate. I'm sure many of you either run innovation workshops or you've been part of some kind of workshop, whether it's a customer journey or innovation workshop. And, and you know, and many of them now are structuring them, I think, and, you know, most of them are quite well run. You start with the problem and do some innovation, do, and then do some experimentation or testing, et cetera. And, um, and everyone wants to jump to the innovation side. So, okay, they go, right, here's the problem. Right, I need to invent stuff. And everyone's rushing off or rushing off to invent stuff. Here. It's, it's actually it's the fun bit, let's admit it, yeah? We all like to be innovators to say, okay, we invented something. Um, but I don't think we spend enough time at that uh, early stage really understanding the problem. And this lesson I learned with this, this, this photo is actually one of the bathrooms in the hotel. And, and because we bought quite a small piece of land, the old tourist office you saw in the image before, um, we had to build up, up the rock face, up the cliff face there. And, um, and so we had to cut into the rock. And initially this uh, bathroom had a wall in front of it. And it was a huge problem we built this bathroom because we painted the wall and very quickly the water came through the wall. You couldn't see the rock face, it was just a brick wall. Water came through and it looked awful. Yeah, it, it really, really looked bad. So we, we tried to um, put sealant on the wall. We tried different paint on the wall. We tried repainting the wall, but no matter what we could do, we just couldn't fix this problem. We kept getting water, would come through, through the rock, through the wall and make the bathroom look awful. And, um, 
And so then I went back to look at the problem. I thought, well, I'm coming up with all these innovations. So let's go back to the problem. And what's the fundamental problem? Water runs off the mountain. And it comes out of the rock. And there's nothing I can do about that. So what I did is I actually ripped down the wall and turned it into a water feature. And so along the bottom of the rock there, you may be able to see there's a little channel which carries the water away. And that rock there has water constantly running over it and down and into this kind of stone sink and then flows away. And so realizing, revisiting the problem, realizing actually the water's unstoppable and then reframing and then redefining and then solutioning from there forward really taught me. And, and from then on, whenever I've been, you know, asked to, you know, perform some kind of innovation or review or build a team or whatever they, or a framework. I spend a lot more time now just focusing on really understanding the problem. Yeah. And, and, and so if you, the better you understand it, the better your solution and, and is going to be, but also just trying to fight that natural urge to go invent something and create some cool solutions and just hold back a bit, you know, spend a little bit more time digging into into the problem. And in the corporate world, it, it's really become clear for me that digital disruption, I'm, I mean, in fairness, you probably never heard of the phrase digital disruption. It's quite a new thing. Um, it doesn't get mentioned much. You might have heard, and there's this other new thing you, you wouldn't have heard of called digital transformation. I think they're brother and sister in this thing. Um, if you're lucky, you might get some consultant or agency come and uh, uh, mention this to you. He, he jokes. Um, and so <laughs> I joke, of course. Everyone's talking about digital transformation <laughs> and disruption. It's just constant oh, ringing in my ears. Um, uh, but there is like a perception that this was caused by technology. And in my mind, it, it wasn't really. It wasn't caused by technology. In my mind, it was caused by, um, I mean, technology was, was certainly part of it, but really it was caused by a very simple thing. And, and that was that um, it was caused by unhappy customers. And so think about the role of any company. A company has one task, one job to do, if you will. And that is to solve its customers' problems. Yeah? And historically, when companies or industries have have diverged from what they think they do and what their customers think they do, then that industry or company is right for disruption. And we see this all the way through history in finance. We see it a lot, you know, uh, a, a bank thinks it sells a car loan where a customer feels a bank, you know, solves their transportation problems. A bank thinks they sell a mortgage where a customer thinks they help them, you know, give their family a home to grow up in. A, a bank thinks they sell them an investment product. But from a customer's perspective, that's their kids' education fund. And so the language and just the process is quite divergent between what a company thinks it does and what a customer thinks it does. And when that gap gets big enough, there's an opportunity for a nuclear probably using tech to come in and disrupt. Then we see this, let's go back, we we'll go back quite some time to the US railroad getting disrupted, you know, when the trucks first came out on the road and started to become ubiquitous, the rail company said, no, this isn't a threat to us. This isn't competition to us because we're a rail company. And of course, <laughs> they took so much business, the trucking business took huge, most of their, the um, business off the railroad because actually the rail company business wasn't railroads. You know, it was, um, it was transportation. <laughs> and, um, and we see this again, you know, the, the, the we, we've seen with Kodak, for example, Kodak, we thought their business was in film or thought their business was in cameras, but in fairness, their business was helping people store memories. And the same with Blockbuster. Blockbuster may have thought its, it's business is in DVDs, 
But again, their business was to entertain people. And so customers have always got problems to solve. They go to corporates to try and solve that problem. The old Peter Drucker thing, which is his statement was it a, a, a customer doesn't buy, um, you know, a drill, a customer is buying a quarter inch hole. So essentially the customer has a problem to solve. I need to hang up this painting. As part of that, I need a hole. As part of that, I need to get it drilled, but drill a hole in the wall through, hang the painting. Actually, the customers not buy drills, they're buying the hole. And, and so when that divergent happens, then between what a customer believes they want, the problems they need to solve, and the company thinks that they are solving, then disruption happens. So this is why my first lesson, get passionate about the problem. Every company should be doubling down and understanding what problems are you solving for your customers? Sometimes you'll be surprised. You know, with, with companies that can be quite complex, the bigger your company, you can be solving problems you don't even know. When I worked at a bank, one of the biggest, one of the big problems we were solving was aged people's boredom. The bank never set out to entertain uh, elderly people. But when you dig into it and start interviewing your customers, you realize actually the, the customers would arrange to meet their friends at the local bank branch. They get there a bit early, sit outside and have some tea. And then they'll all go in the branch and take out, you know, their $10. And then they go off and, you know, have, have coffee somewhere. Maybe it's part of their, it was part of their rhythm. It's part of, um, you know, their kind of social fabric was, was going to the bank branch. And, and, and so that's the thing. We're seeing that companies are starting to get it, but really in digital transformation, if, if you don't have that lens, if you're not trying to work out what problems you're solving, then I question, are you solving the right problems? Or are you just throwing tech at it and just doing, you know, transformation because everyone else is and, and um, you feel you need to with that really laser focus on what problems you're solving, what ones you know about, what ones don't you know about, and how can you be more effective and how do you close that gap and so there's no room for a disruptor. In fact, you become the disruptor. So the uh, next thing I want to talk around, and I should have, in fairness, put this one first, and I think I did in another presentation, but now it's my second learning. But, you know, for me, everyone gets fed. So when I turned up and I started, we bought the old tourist office, and I got really excited because most of my life, well, all my life, really, I've been doing digital innovation. So I've even written computer games in the 80s and 90s and business software in the 90s, 2000s. You know, APIs in the 2000s, data systems for companies, um, websites, you know, you, you've named it, I, I, I kind of built it. Um, but the trouble with digital innovation, it doesn't last very long. And so I was really excited about physical innovation, building a hotel, I get to get some new tools, you know, I get to get, you know, big drills and chainsaws and cement mixers. And, and, and so when the, the team bought the first, you know, Bought the tourist office, right, let's get started. Hey, the first thing my business partner, Abdullah, uh, bought was, was a rice cooker. And so <laughs> imagine my disappointment. I looked at it, I was like, oh, it, it, you know, I, in fairness, I'm not a huge chef myself. I said, oh, is that like a small cement mixer? He said, no, it's a rice cooker. I said, oh, yeah, but Abdullah, I'm not like a huge fan of rice. And in fairness, I'll just go to the local, you know, um, uh, shop and, and buy something or restaurant. He goes, no, this is for the staff. So, oh, okay, well, don't they eat themselves? He goes, oh, no, now that's the thing now. So now, now you've hired them, that you now need to feed them. So that was a, a real realization. What do you feed them? Oh, yeah, and house them. They live on the construction site. They need to feed them. And so from that day till this, which I think uh, must be eight, nine years now, um, I'm, I'm still to this day, I'm feeding all my staff and housing many of them as well. And that was a real, real shock for me coming from a more Western background, European background. 
and and you know realizing that I'm you know I'm not only the the leader, the boss, my friend, and I like to think, but I'm also the provider of their food as well and, and shelter in many cases. I, I'm responsible for them. I look after them. And um, and that made me really think when I went back to the corporate world is how do you make sure that you feed the people you work with? You know? And you can feed people in many different ways. I mean, I've worked in, in sales for a good proportion of my life and a lot of that set into finance organizations. And in that regard, you know, you really have to think about your network and making sure that you are there to help your customer achieve what they will. Yeah. And essentially help your customer ultimately achieve their bonus if you're working with an executive in a bank and you're trying to sell them a technology platform, you know, ultimately you want that initiative to be very successful for your customer. Personally, I mean, the company, obviously, we always focus on, you know, this tech platform is going to increase profit, reduce cost, improve customer set. But for that person that you're dealing with at that organization, I mean, it also has to be successful for them. Yeah? They have to be fed. And so it's interesting when you think about the, the people you work with, especially when you do an innovation, which is, you know, can be quite risky, can be um, quite hard. It's how do you reward people who step out of their comfort zone and do something? And obviously, you know, um, mind you, in fairness, I worked in Singapore for many years and um, they do love their food there. So a, a lot of the innovation events, we used to give free hawker food and you know we get people turn up and actually literally um they did enjoy being fed also people need other sorts of food they need recognition they need reward and um, even just giving them a channel that finally they can get their idea out that finally there's someone in a company they can talk to who's going to take them seriously around their crazy innovation idea and maybe you know just maybe there's a channel to you know, commercialization and success of their concept. And, and so when you think about, you know, who gets fed in your organization, ideally you want to harness all these people across your group and make sure they get fed. Now we found, I mean, it's just amazing the people that would pop out of the woodwork and, you know, I didn't work for a, it was a fairly big bank, but about 25,000 staff. But the amount of people that started to come out of the woodwork, you know, wanting, as they saw that people got recognized, you know, with a good example is we did a simple thing, I'm sure many of you have done it, a crowdsourcing platform. And and in that, you know, setting challenges from the execs and getting staff to put in their ideas and comment, other staff to comment on them and we've filter them to winners and then those winners will get a bit of funding and move into execution. And, and that was a great way that giving at least the staff a voice that you're important, you are the ones that are helping not only to do the kind of, you know, in a company, you're the workers, you're the ones actually doing this stuff, making the company successful, but you're also defining the future of the company. It's not just, you know, the three or four people at the top, the highly paid people in this organization, which is defining the strategy for this business. You know, this company, and that's what we want to get to is this, you know, this company doesn't have like three heads and 25,000 arms and legs. No, no, no. This company has 25,000 heads and 25,000 pairs of arms and legs. We're all in together. We're all getting, you know, we're getting recognized. You're getting rewarded if you're going to do something. We have to take it to some, kind, you know, some quite extremes on that to encourage people to you know, do something new, be more experimental, change the reward structure in that regard. But it's very important that to think about that as you try to activate something new and you've got people who flock to your banner or your thought or your project, is to be quite conscious on how you're going to feed them, how you're going to recognize and reward them. And for many people, you know, I found is actually they just want their ideas heard and in fact, as they may not be the world's best ideas or they want to learn. So they want to be part of something that can learn a lot. Yeah. 
And so spending time teaching, you know, the people who you work with some quite rare knowledge or knowledge that isn't the accessible or, or experiences or toolkits they can get from anyone else means a lot of the time that's all the the feeding that they would want at that time. So anyway, it, it's a complex thing, but really crystallized for me that when I had to start feeding my construction people and, and um, giving them something to live, that actually I should be feeding the people who've worked with me, not just for me, but with me and partnered with me and become part of my you know, innovation journey through the corporate world. They need feeding as well. And so the next lesson is, is based around, actually, <laughs> funnily enough, I was talking to Harry um, earlier in the week, is around Harry. And it's around giving a, a safe place to innovate. So this is the restaurant in the hotel. This is Harry. So Harry's a lovely chap. Um, he wears, um, you know, thick woolly hats. And that's, that day was probably 32 degrees and 100% humidity in the jungle. <laughs> but anyway, so Harry's job was to carry the bags of cement. Um, uh, so the, the jungle, as you saw, the jungle hotel is quite remote. It's not super remote, you know, a road is about, the road stops about 100 meters from the hotel. So there's a little bit of a walk, but the road stops. And so everything from that point forward needs to come on motorbike. And so Harry's job was to take the, and everything you've seen in the hotel had to come by motorbike, everything along the track. There is no other way. And so that's the toilets, that's the rocks you see there, the wood, the bamboo, the cement, the sand, everything comes on the back of a motorbike. So Harry's job was to take the cement off the back of the bike and and mix it ready for the builders to do the building work. And at the end of the day, I noticed that Harry, because he had cement that was going off, you know, in the heat, it couldn't be used. So Harry could would carve in it and make nice shapes, very artistic. And I kind of noticed this. I said, oh, Harry, um, would you like to do some, you know, some carving, some design for the hotel, maybe in the restaurant. This week, I want you to carve, put some cement in this area and do nice design and then photograph and send to me in Singapore and then break it. Okay. I said every day do different one, but the one on Friday needs to be the special one. And I'm going to come on Friday. So don't break the Friday one. When I come on Friday, I want to see it. So it's like, okay, boss. No matter how many times you ask them to not call you boss, um, they still call you boss. <laughs> I've given up on that many years ago. But anyway, so <laughs> yes, boss. So, okay. So then I came back on Friday, done this beautiful artwork, which you see here. And and then, you know, we got him to do other wood carving, um, cement carvings, and he does wood carving as well. And he um, actually, we're getting about to do some more work. And he set up his own business doing cement carving for other um, tourist hotels. And, and so what we did, we gave him a safe place to innovate. You could tell that he was really uncomfortable trying something new and and because he just didn't want to do bad work. He didn't want to, you know, make, make um, you know, other people unhappy. He'd never done it before. So because I took away the risk and said, look, you, you, you do the carving, then you smash it and then you, you know, you're done, and then just do it again. So it doesn't matter, you're still getting paid. Just keep carving and smashing. There's no impact on you doing this wrong. But that gave him then the confidence and the space to do it. And, and that's a, the huge thing, is getting th this place to feel safe. We, you know, I, I'm constantly amazed by the amount of people who call themselves leaders. I try not to call myself a leader, um, but you know, you kind of in the context of this, we have to, but the amount of people who are managers that, that call themselves leaders, you know, to be a leader, you really, I mean, just, you know, you have to uh, do one thing that's, you know, lead um, and not, not manage. But part of that, as we know, a lot of leaders, they talk about their leadership philosophies, how they're amazing a leader, especially in FinTech, it's quite hilarious if you want to go Next time you see a fintech leader on stage talk about how amazing they are, um, my recommendation is go to glassdoor.com and, and see what their staff say about them. 
because <laughs> you will find some quite different perceptions of of, of what they say on um, what they say in the public compared with um, what their staff think. And actually, the complete opposite is true in many many cases. But anyway, so what are your jobs as a leader? Yeah, number one is protect the staff. Yeah, give them safety, and and not just you know not just say that, but do it to such a degree that you'd be willing to. You know, I've threatened to resign for staff before. Everything that happens in my company or my division or my hotels is my fault. Now, whether I knew about it or not, especially if I didn't know about it, especially if it was someone junior who made a mistake, it's my fault. That's it, full stop, it's my fault. It's not their fault, it's my fault. I should have trained them better. Um, I should have been more involved. I should have done pre-meetings. It's all my fault. And once your staff realise, actually, you're a different kind of boss, you really, you mean that, that it is your fault, and you will take that, you know, it, countless times I've had that with junior staff, letting them know that, hey, I know that blah, 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 something went wrong with a project, but don't worry about it yet, because it's kind of my fault. Um, you know, it's not going to affect your performance, you know, we, we, if you want to create an environment of people who are doing their careers best work, we're trying to do the amazing, yeah? trying to do world's best stuff. If you're going to drive them to that level of execution and, and get them so passionate about doing something which is truly, or at least trying to do something truly legendary, you have to look after them. You have to protect them. You have to give them a safe place, a safe place to innovate. And my final thing I want to talk about is models to drive behavior. And this is a bit of a sad story. It, it, it's sad and then it's all good now. So, um, But it started off very sad. This is Malin. And uh, Malin was one of um, the construction team on, on the first project on the first building in Hotel Arrangement, actually on the second. And um, as I said, you know, I'd leave work uh, and get on a flight into Sumatra every Friday, come back on Sunday. And when I landed in Sumatra, I have uh, my good friend, Mr. Mahmoud, um, I lent him the money to buy an MPV so then he could um, do the driving for the hotel. So we gave him the transport business. I lent him the money, paid me back. And he's got a few, a few different vehicles now. That um, And he runs all the transport for the hotel, so he's got his own business. And Mr. Mahmoud's when he picked me up from the airport, said, oh, boss, we have a problem. I said, okay, what's that? He said, oh, Melon's had an, an accident. And I uh, said, oh, okay, um, let me, uh, what's happened? He said, oh, he's almost cut his arm off. So he's using an angle grinder on some steel and really quite bad. He said, oh, he's in hospital. And um, so not good. So, you know, uh, my flight was late. I said, probably about 7 p.m. It's raining. Um, I said, I'll take you to the hospital. He goes, oh, boss, but hotel's this way, hospital's that way. It's going to be a long journey tonight. So I said, no, take you to the hospital. Um, it's next to like three hour into the journey. And, um, and so I turned up at the hospital. I didn't know what to do. I mean, geez, you know, one of my teams almost cut his arm off. And, um, and so I said, oh, Melbourne. Uh, turn up at the hospital and he's laying in bed and he's white. You can see here, you know, he's got a, a you know, nice rich colouring. But he looked ashen in, in the hospital and his arm was all in plaster. And his mum was sat there crying and his sister um, was there as well. And I turned up and his mum looked at me, you know, it's like, oh, oh, she's really excited. Big boss is here. She looked at me and with hope in her eyes, yeah. And I chatted to Mowen I said, oh, what happened? And, you know, it's clear he's not going to be able to work. And Mowen's dad had died a little while ago. So Mowen was the only revenue generator in the family. Yeah? So the younger sister was still at school and Mowen made the money. And, it, you know, I had to make a decision. So Mahmoud talked to the mother and the hospital bills were, were pretty big. For, I mean, for them, relatively, they were pretty big. And this is before... Um, thankfully, they got basic health cover in Indonesia a few years back. Um, and, um, 
And, she, you know, Mr. Madman said, oh, the mother was asking whether you'd help with the hospital bills. And I said, well, because they're too much here. And I said, well, um, they have no money. And now he's lost his job. So I said, look, I'm not going to pay the hospital bill. And, and, you know, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't a huge amount. In fairness, it was you know, probably a couple of flights for me. Um, but I said, no, I'm going to pay half. I'll pay half now. And um, let's discuss this again tomorrow. So let's go to the hotel. And, you know, that obviously, the mum was more than happy with that, didn't expect more. Um, this isn't, um, you know, the, the, as I said, she didn't, they didn't have health insurance. And so the next, it, we drove to the hotel through the rain. And in the morning, I got the head of construction, Johnny, said, right, Johnny, come have a chat with me at the hotel. I said, what happened in Mauer? He goes, oh, he cut his arm, no good. I said, oh, I have to pay his medical. He goes, oh, no, no need to pay medical, not your problem, boss. Well, I said, look, so what I've done is I've paid half the medical, only half. And I said, I need you to do something, the head of construction. He said, what? So I need you to pay the other half. And he refused. He said, no, we don't do that in Indonesia. We don't. I said, oh, that's fine, <laughs> Johnny, because you're fired. I said, get off, get off the picket your tools, move the team out, you're fired. I'm going to get another team to finish the hotel because I don't want to work um, with someone who doesn't look after his people. And then Johnny came back in the afternoon and agreed to pay. And, um, and, and so all of Mellon's medical bills were paid. Now, why did I do that? I said it wasn't a huge amount for me. I could have quite easily afforded the total medical bill. Two reasons. One is, you know, I had a lot of construction guys and Mao and I kind of knew because he was one of the more friendly ones and his English was a bit better. So we'd say hello and I'd recognize him. But imagine there's no healthcare, there's no safety net in the village. Anyone can have an accident. What I was worried about is being gamed. So someone has an accident over here, then magically they become one of my staff because they know now, the whole village knows, boss pays free medical. So I didn't want to set up a, uh, these unintended consequences of me trying to do good, but actually set up a system where I end up being gamed. Number one. Number two, making Johnny pay half of it meant I never had an accident on the building site again. Because he knew he was liable for half of all medical bills. And so he made sure that people got trained on the tools and safety was, was improved through that. And so the lesson of this is, you know, I mean, you won't see an example like this in corporate life, I'm sure. But the point is, be very scientific and thoughtful around the model you set up. And so I set up a model where, one, I wasn't open to being gamed or, you know, um, uh, being being forced into paying medical for people that weren't my staff just because I was the only boss for, you know, 100 miles who does that. And at the same time, I increased safety on the site because I made the responsibility of that being the head of construction. And, and so that model works beautifully. And, and, and so we, we, I feel that there's still, there's a long way to go around thinking through the models we implement and, and, and you know, being a gamer and, and now, and, and, and to know how people, for example, when you set up KPIs, how people can gain the KPIs to get the result they want, or you set up KPIs that, that drive unintended consequences. It doesn't get the result that your business requires or the contracts and relationship um, that you set up with your partners drives, don't drive the behaviors that you want to see. And I suppose that's the lesson from this is, is really be thoughtful about the model you set up that, and, and a, a kind of deeper understanding of the intricacies of 
how that model will change behavior. And so thank you 